Thank you. I that is much better. All right, we're going to call this meeting to order. Um, the first item is to approve the agenda. I would like to add an item myself. Um, I would like to discuss emails to the board, and that could just, uh, let's see, public comment by email. Are there any objections to adding this to the approval or to the agenda? None. All right, so approved. Uh, that could just go at the very end, Amelia, would be fine. For announcements, I just wanted to say the Woodland Groundbreaking Ceremony was on Saturday. Marie, Penny, and Megan attended. I wanted to thank the foundation and everyone who helped put that together. It looked like it was a really fun time. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to uh, keep moving if someone could help them at all. I'm not sure. Is there a speaker? We should. Let's put a speaker yeah. out there. There's also the option, even though it's not going to be um, great to log in through Zoom if you need to hear better that way, but we do need to keep keep moving though. Okay, so yeah. Do you need some time? Is this something you could do? Take your time, go ahead, five minutes, thank you. While he's doing that, um, well, I'll just give him five minutes and then we'll start up again, thank you.
Microphone. Can you guys hear me outside? Test on the microphone. Can you hear me? Oh, good. Okay. Can you pass this on to Amelia? Thank you. Okay, we're going to try one more time. Um, I know. So did we get the um, agenda? Okay. All right. I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as amended. I move we approve the agenda as amended. Seconded. Can we get a roll call vote, please? Penny Love Hensley? Aye. Vikram Katwani? Aye. We can't hear you, Vic. Uh, that's the audio problem then. You're muted. Vikram, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. I can hear you. <laughs> you sound fine to me. Can you hear us? Yes. We can't, we can see you, but we can't hear you. Are you? Are you muted? Okay. No, I'm not. Okay. Let let me check. He's typing. It looks like. Will someone be able to watch chat for his input during the meeting? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We have heart music. Vikram, did you type your response? Yes, I did. Okay. Oh, we hear you now. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, so what was your vote? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, Megan Dugan. Aye. Murray Coffey? Aye. Olga Hodges? Aye. Mary Ann Duncan Cole? Aye. And Christy Morgan? Aye. Agenda is approved. Um, we'll move on to public comment. And before we get started, um, I would ask that you show us no videos or play any recordings. We want to hear your comments. No applause between speakers, please. And keep your comments directed toward the board, not toward each other or out at the audience. Um, be respectful with your comments. I, I didn't think I'd say this, but no foul language or cursing, please. We will keep a timer on the screen. Everyone gets two minutes. We'll go for one hour. We're gonna alternate between in-person and virtual. And if we still have time left at the end of the hour, we'll take additional comments after that. When you approach the microphone, please say your name again. Are you? Our first speaker is Katie Gardner. Good evening, Goldendale. My name is Katherine Gardner, pronoun she, her, and I am a resident of Vancouver. The month of June is Pride Month, a month when the LGBTQIA community celebrates and remembers. It is more than just a party or a parade. Pride is a memorial to those in our community who we've lost along the way and a call to endure and thrive. It is a time of joy, which in the face of hatred is the most radical of acts. It is a time of community, of finding your home when you've been told you don't belong. It is a time of love, of rejoicing in the perfection of your heart. It is a time of visibility, of taking a risk to help others feel less alone. This pride, I would like to thank those employees of the Fort Vancouver Regional Library who truly embody the mission, vision, and values of this system on a daily basis. Their commitment to strengthening our communities through knowledge, experiences, and creativity, especially in a time where there is growing resistance to all three, is awe-inspiring. I have seen firsthand the kindness, generosity, and knowledge the branch staffs possess and offer to everyone they encounter even the difficult patrons who don't think the library should be for everyone. I have seen them stand up against censorship, 
keeping the library's values of empathy, dignity, and respect while facing verbal attacks that lacked all three. FVRL's vision that everyone in our communities is valued and empowered to succeed lives in the people who represent the library on a public and daily basis. Pride is for everyone, and so is the library. Thank you, FVRL employees, for all you do to keep our communities informed, safe, and welcoming for all. Sarah Wu. And after Sarah will be Jude Jacobs. Hello, my name is Sarah Wu. I have been a member of the Friends of the Library. I have been here for nearly 25 years. Is that microphone on? Yeah, it is. Okay. okay, this will be short. My name is Sarah Wu. I've been a friend of the library for nearly 25 years. Of course, I'm very disturbed about people trying to limit what our community has access to. And the only thing that I want to suggest is that the library have a policy that it is the whoever is responsible for children. It's their responsibility to decide what they read, not the library's responsibility. And so books should not be banned from the library. Let the responsible people and many adults can use the whole spectrum of information. Thank you. After Jude will be Larry Hochter. Hello, my name is Jude. Um, and today I wanted to talk a little bit about Pride Month. Um, we know that Pride is, you know, the opposite of shame, right? Um, I was proud to get to go to our Vancouver Pride block party celebration. And I was really happy to see the library represented there. And I felt like it was encouraging to hear folks and to see them encouraging folks to read and really help break down shame. Shame is, as described by Brene Brown, is a deeply painful and isolating emotion that arises from the belief that we're fundamentally flawed or unworthy of love and belonging. It's the intense feeling of not being enough or not meeting the expectations of others or ourselves. Brown emphasizes that shame thrives in secrecy, silence, and judgment, and it has a corrosive impact on our well-being and relationships. It triggers a strong desire to hide and, or withdraw, and as we fear rejection or abandonment, and it can lead to social withdrawal and isolation as individuals, you know, don't want to be judged or rejected. In short, guilt says I did something bad, and shame says I am someone bad. Shame has been associated with a range of negative outcomes, including development or exacerbation of mental health conditions like depression and anxiety disorders, substance use disorders, maladaptive coping strategies like self-harm, and an increased risk of suicide. Pride Month events, parades, and celebrations create highly visible and inclusive spaces where queer individuals can express their identities openly and without shame. Seeing others who are similar and feeling and, and seeing them feel pride helps reduce that sense of shame. Pride events foster a sense of belonging, acceptance, and understanding, reducing the feelings of shame and isolation. And as someone who's attended them, I can say that they promote self-acceptance and empower individuals to challenge internalized shame and negative societal messages. Um, we aren't here to turn kids, straight kids gay or cisgender kids trans. We're here to keep queer kids alive. And I, I hope that the library continues to support creating a culture of diversity. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Larry Hochter. After Larry will be Emily Losness. Hello, I'm uh, Larry Hochter. I was born and raised in Golden Hill and, and uh, lived out of the state for a while. Now I'm back. I want to thank you, the board, for coming out to all parts of the community. I'm assuming that you go to each and every library and holder meetings. So I appreciate that, that you come out and see what the real world's like, um, rather than just being in one spot. So thank you. After Emily will be Mike, Mark, excuse me, excuse me, Mike Hart Hartaloo. 
Hi there, my name is Emily and I use she, her pronouns and I'm a resident of Vancouver. Thank you to the board for letting me speak here tonight in support of bringing back Drag Queen Story Hour. Public libraries are spaces dedicated to knowledge and learning for expanding our understanding of the world and the people, past and present, who call it home. Like humans, libraries are hardwired for connection. We can get lost in great stories, seeing ourselves in characters who were conceptualized hundreds or even thousands of years ago, and we see how the past has laid the foundation for where we are today. Libraries teach us that in this great big world, while every story is unique, we can find connection, a part of ourselves, in every one of them. This is what makes libraries so scary for people who want to make our world smaller, darker, and less compassionate than it really is. This idea that, although they're taught otherwise, that they might find some similarities with those they have been taught to fear. This argument against Drag Queen Story Hour is the antithesis of what public libraries stand for. Drag queens in this space teach children that love is love, to treat people with kindness, and to never judge a book by its cover. Is that not what libraries are for? I'm sure today we'll hear about how drag queens are trying to indoctrinate children with their ideologies. As someone who has actually been to a drag queen story hour, I can tell you firsthand that these are that, that, that these scary ideologies are love, kindness, acceptance, and connection. There is no indoctrination, but merely a loving, safe space created where everyone is welcome so long as you're not harming yourself or others. There will be people tonight that say that drag queens invoke gender confusion in kids and that that is harmful by nature. This doesn't happen. If your kid was questioning their gender, they were questioning long before they saw a man in a wig reading, if you give a mouse a cookie, to them and their peers. What they did see is that this man in a wig was loved and accepted by their community, which isn't harmful, it's healing. This kind of revelation of recognizing that you're not alone and that people will love you and embrace you with open arms isn't harmful, it's life-saving. And that connection, this knowledge turned into empowerment is exactly what libraries are for. Thank you. After Mike Hartaloo, Michael Hodges. Hello, Mike Hartlow, lifelong Clark County resident and current Vancouver resident. June is Alzheimer's and Brain Awareness Month. This month provides an opportunity to discuss the brain and Alzheimer's diseases and other dementias, a major public health issue. The 2023 Alzheimer's disease facts and figures report that Alzheimer's Association states that more than 6 million Americans are living with Alzheimer's and over 11 million are providing unpaid care for people living with Alzheimer's and other dementias. The reason I bring this up is I find it discriminating. Um, when I went to the website, nothing, I, I see Pride Month, which it is, and it's also Alzheimer's Month. Why, why would the, uh, the virtue signal of putting Pride? I just find it very discriminating in the so-called Unity Month that nothing's mentioned. I have, a, I have a close friend whose mother is in the early stage of Alzheimer's and it's terrible, I think we'd all agree. So why are we discriminating against one group and promoting another group? Thank you. After Michael Hodges, Matt Childs. Hello there, my name is Michael Hodges. Um, I know I'm a local Orthodox Christian. Um, I'm speaking today because I'm saddened and disgusted by the things that are being displayed in our library here in Goldendale, more specifically, I'm saddened by the content being displayed in the children's section of our library. Uh, one year ago, I was shocked to learn that there was pornographic content in the 12 year old section of the Goldendale Public Library. I was even more shocked to learn that the book under question had been read by our local head librarian and that she had argued in favor of the book and thought it was uh, suitable for young children. Despite the sexual acts being depicted by minors within the first few pages of the book, I think. Um, any sane person can clearly see how inappropriate that is. Uh, several books were checked out around this time from the young adults section. The books and the images in the books were obscene, age inappropriate, and very damaging to minors. They included nudity, sexual acts between minors, as I already said, torture, literal satanic ritual, and depictions of sexual abuse rituals. I would also like to make, uh, just take a moment and advocate for displays that fit our local values. Um, there's little to no books that represent our local Christian, cultural, Native American, homeschooling, or traditional values. The books um, on display should represent uh, our community and not political values and little ideologies more commonly found on the side of the, of the state, um, such as the two dozen book um, 
pride display that was in the children's section of the library. Um, you know, I understand everybody who wants to talk about uh, inclusivity and everyone having a voice, but I feel like what's really happening is by doing that, you're taking the voice away from a lot of different people and you're pushing your ideology on a lot of people who just kind of want to go along. Thank you. After Matt Childs, Quill Onstead. Is this a little bit? Um, thank you, board, for this opportunity. My name is Matt Childs. There are flags that we in civil society find agreeable and other flags that we find highly offensive. How we view flags and simple symbols changes with time. For example, I give you the Confederate flag, the stars and bars. When I was young in the 1970s and 80s, this flag was a symbol of rebellion, like the Che Guevara poster or a fist in the air. The flag was also commonly used in popular culture and TV shows like the Dukes of Hazard, and also in multiple official state flags. It was readily available as a rebel flag for purchase and was seen on bumper stickers, t-shirts, and other products. But the meaning of that flag has changed with time. Extremist groups such as the KKK started using the flag as a symbol of racism. Today, instead of rebellion, the flag is seen by many to represent a return to slavery, racism, and hate. It is no longer a flag that would be displayed in a public place like a library. Now, a similar fate has overtaken the rainbow flag of the LGBT community. This was once a flag of pride and a flag to encourage everyone to love and respect all people, regardless of their sexual orientation. But the rainbow flag has now been co-opted by other forces from the far left. It has come to represent those who would castrate and mutilate children, those who would sexually groom young children, those who would seek to separate children from their families for sexual purposes, it represents a movement that seeks to abolish free speech by publicly shaming and silencing those that it disagrees with. It represents a movement that uses violence and intimidation to reach its goals. It is a flag that my friends in the LGBT community no longer fly. It has become a flag of hate, a flag that me and many others find highly offensive and triggering. I would respectfully request that this rainbow flag no longer be publicly displayed in our libraries. Thank you. After Quill, after Quill, Tiffany Hine. Hi. Is it on? Hang on. Can you hear me now? Okay. Hi, my name is Quill Onstead and my pronouns are they, them. I'm here to speak in support of Drag Queen Story Hour as a genderqueer member of the community. What the hell has a drag queen ever done to make you have so much respect for them? We've all heard that line from a video clip opponents of Drag Queen Story Hour used to play. Drag queens are vital members of the LGBTQ plus community. What have drag queens done to make me have so much respect for them? I stand on the shoulders of giants. The police who entered the Stonewall Inn in 1969 were targeting drag queens and kings. Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, Miss Major Griffin Gracie, and others fought back. Drag queens were the spark that lit the fire for LGBTQ plus rights. Without them, I would not be here before you today. Drag queens raised funds and provided community support during the AIDS epidemic. Drag queens ran needle exchanges, cooked meals, comforted the dying and the bereaved when the government ignored our community. Drag queens inspire. Drag queens teach. Drag queens are positive role models of acceptance to anyone who isn't accusing them of pedophilia and grooming and indoctrination. What the hell has a drag queen ever done to make me respect them so much? A hell of a lot, it turns out. Drag Queen Story Hour is a vital program that teaches kids about gender identity in an age-appropriate manner. Parents who do not approve of Drag Queen Story Hour do not have to bring their children to any Drag Queen Story Hour programs. Please allow the staff of FBRL Libraries to present Drag Queen Story Hour and have the district live up to the ideals espoused in FBRL Libraries' equity statement. Thank you for your service to the community.
Um, I, I don't, well, I'm not going to argue with you about it, Anna. Um, after Tiffany, Amanda Richards. Good evening, board. My name is Tiffany Heine. I'm from Vancouver, Washington. <clears throat> Pride is not a cure for shame. It's a source of it. We make choices, but in the end, the, our choices make us. When there is injustice, keeping silent is never the way to go. Some will take the wrong side of crisis and some will stand for what is right. To those who refuse to pick a side and maintain neutrality, they are aiding the wrong side indirectly and that makes them even worse. Evil only has the power we give it. Dante Alighieri wrote, the darkest places in hell are reserved for those who maintain their neutrality in times of moral crisis. If you don't think that Drag Queen Story Hour is a deceptive plan to help conquer the sexualization of children, you're gravely mistaken. I've stated before, and I will again, those that are pushing this ideology on children don't give one cent for children, and frankly, they don't give one cent for drag queens either. Both are pawns in an evil agenda bigger than any of us. So board members, you de your decision has consequences, good or evil. My hope is your conscience will be your guide. Thank you. After Amanda. Hello, thank you for the opportunity. And I'm really excited about all the people here tonight. I'm a homeschooling mother of three. I raised my children in the library from Washington, from Vancouver to White Salmon to here. I will no longer allow my children to come to the library by themselves. As, as a homeschooling mother, I've almost used, solely used the library to homeschool my children. My two eldest are in college at 16 and 18. They're on the Dean's list. And I attribute a lot of that to the, the library. If we didn't have the amazing selection, the, uh, the hotspots, which I, we need, <laughs> Um, and all of the different programs, I, my kids, they, it would be a lot tougher for them to, to be homeschooled. We live off grid. We don't have internet. We do everything with books and the library programs. But unfortunately, I can't let my kids come to the library anymore. There's, there's, we, can, we can be accepting of everybody, but we don't have to shove it in everybody's faces. We, don't, we can have um, people in areas with like adult stuff in adult areas. Um, I reject the offensive agenda that's being pushed onto society and especially our children. If you must have literature, you can at least display it in an appropriate way away from children. If FVRL believes in respect, please respect our children. Let them be children. Why should we shove an agenda down their throats? And most importantly, I have to ask not why do kids need drag queen story hour, but why do drag queens need our children? No applause, thank you. After Gary Wilson, Father John Phelps. Thank you, library board members. The term marginalized community has been used for several years now. And when it comes to one particular group, that term no longer applies. The word marginalized and magnified are being confused. There is a formerly marginalized community that has for decades now been given an entire month to promote itself with parades in hundreds of cities across this country as well as others. They are celebrated with a rack of books in the center of every library in this country. It seems everywhere you look, everywhere you shop, everything you watch, there is a promotion of themselves demanding you take notice. Many cities are forcing police and fire stations to fly the pride flag alongside the American flag. One symbolizes division, the other unity in our country, the American flag. This community is no longer marginalized. They are magnified. Can we all agree? So let's stop playing the victim card. I'll tell you who recently were victims. Six innocent people in a Tennessee Christian school a few months ago, three of them children, murdered simply for having a different belief system than a so-called marginalized person who viciously and ruthlessly, without cause, shot them dead. The Trans Resistance Network publicly stated that the so-called marginalized person, quote, had no other effective way to be seen than to lash out by taking the life of others. Life for transgender people is very difficult. Hate has consequences. Well, they got one thing right. Hate does have consequences. If you hate like this so-called marginalized person did, 
you will kill innocent men, women, and even children. Please don't have another drag queen story hour. Don't make innocent children be their victims. If parents want to take them, you know, not all parents have the best interest of their children. I mean, some are, there are sexual abusers out there. They, you know, traffic kids, you know, you can't trust every parent. You, if you're doing this, you're enabling those to harm their children. Thank you. Who's going next? Rebecca Johnson is next. Hello, thank you. Am I here now? Okay. Hello, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm obviously an Orthodox priest, um, and um, I got my child got an email the other day about um, about L, uh, LGBTQ. I don't remember all the acronyms anymore. Uh, it seems to change, but. Um, and I would like to echo what uh, the lady said earlier, that there's there seems to be a lack of um, interest in including parents in, uh, in these sorts of things. The kind of people that, um, the, the kind of people that I would trust my children with would not talk with them about sexual uh, sexually related things. I spend a lot of time with children. I have a lot of children in my parish and I don't talk to them about sex unless they come to me or their parents ask me to talk to them about it. Um, especially at young ages, I won't talk to them. Um, so my request to the library board would be that we keep sex out of the conversation for, uh, for children without their parents, uh, without the parents and parents blessing. Um, failing that, uh, what's going to end up happening is, um, you know, Orthodox people have been uh, persecuted for many centuries uh, all over the world. And we end up becoming, we end up folding into ourselves. I don't want to do that. Um, I really don't. I like this community. I love this community. It's, I, I chose to live here. And uh, I, I don't, I don't want us to have to, uh, become marginalized and closed to ourselves. That's all. Thank you. After Rebecca Johnson, Mindy Clark. Thank you. My name is Rebecca Johnson. I moved to Goldendale three years ago, and this is my first time in the library. At first, it was due to COVID, so I created an account online so I could order books. The problem was whenever I looked online for a book I needed my kids to read for school, they were not available at this location. In the end, it was faster for me to order it new on Amazon rather than have it transferred from another library. And since I'm usually a last minute person, that's what I ended up doing because they needed it for class, you know, within the next two or three days. When the library did reopen, I heard about all the different books that were available to the kids section, especially the ones that were specifically chosen for display. My youngest son is 10, and he remembers everything he sees and hears. It's scary sometimes. I can't bring him to a place that has these types of books on display for him to see. He's too young to be inundated with sexual ideologies. Kids at that age are so innocent and pure and too easily persuaded in one way or another, and they get so confused. It's my job to protect him from these persuasions and guide him until he's old enough to make his own conscientious decisions. I'm not asking that these books be removed from the library. I just feel so strongly that there are more appropriate books that we can openly display for the young eyes of our community. We need more nonfiction and classical reading choices in our library, especially with the high population of homeschoolers in the area like myself. For my kids reading list for next school year, only four of the 13 books that they need are available at this location. I find that extremely sad and frustrating that any library would not have the basic classics available. Out of those books, even many of them were, there were so few in your whole system, and I know they can be transferred, but they were either checked out on hold or in transfer that they're not available when I need them for their online classes. Thank you. After Mindy, Lisa Childs. Uh, 
Yes, uh, my name is Mindy Clark. I'm a homeschool mom, and I'm also an Orthodox Christian. Um, I too find it, um, I find myself hesitant to come to the library and to let my children roam freely throughout the library or in the kids section. Um, um, I often, if we are there, I'm often looking ahead on the shelves as they're looking. So as an, or whatever they're pulling down to, so I'll often scan it really quick to make sure it's something that it's safe for us to hold or read. And there's been things that I've put in there out of order or put randomly places um, because it's not safe for children to consume. Um, I also find it hard to have books readily available that are on a book list for homeschool curriculums. Um, for example, the Ambleside um, homeschool curriculum, it's a free it's a free one. And they often have classical literature for children. Again, those titles aren't readily available at our location. You do have to order or request them to, to purchase or you end up buying them. Um, so I would like to see more of, of those kinds of rich things offered for our children in the library. And also some kind of um, a place where they can't readily access these other kinds of things to keep them innocent for as long as possible. Um, also, um, I do, uh, I'm a member of a homeschool co-op. We've come to the library, we had a field trip. It was great, it was wonderful. And I would like to see, um, but in June, it was in May, in June, I have not come here one time uh, to do anything in the library with my children because it's just not safe for them to be here and it makes me feel uncomfortable as a parent. Thank you. After Lisa, Becky Martin. Um, thank you, I'm Lisa Childs. Um, I have, my oldest is 24 and um, we moved to the community before she was born and she participated in preschool story hour librarians were wonderful Susan is a delight um so I have five kids they've grown up in the library um that's where we met friends um got in touch with the community um so I want to say thank you to all you who've who've served and kept the library going um and just recently um, uh, we had an interaction with the library staff during COVID, a curious son who wanted to know, like, if he didn't wear his mask, would the cops get called? And he experimented and he found out and he wrote a letter apologizing to the librarians for being disrespectful of the rules. And they handled it very graciously and professionally and courteously. They wrote him back, said, you know, thank you um, for learning from this and for, um, being willing to respect the rules and you're welcome in the library. So we've had very, very good interactions with professional staff. Um, my current area of concern is of course the, the pride displays. Um, I believe it is a parent's decision when to talk to their children about um, lifestyle issues, um, sexual behaviors and um, that sort of jumps the gun. If a parent isn't ready to talk to their small children about this, walking past a lot of um, pride displays and flags is gonna bring up conversations that parents may not be ready to have with their children. So um, in the interest of letting parents decide um, what's best for their children and the timing for that, um, more neutral displays would be appropriate. Thank you so much. After Becky, Curtis Wilson. Hello, my name's Becky. Thanks for allowing me to address you. I grew up here in Goldendale coming to this library and I loved it. I came here all the time by myself and I still love libraries. I'm a homeschooling mother of two kids. I realize libraries are changing into collaborative learning centers. I can see there are some positives to this change. However, in practice, some of these changes have made the library not a safe place for my children to go as freely as I did when I was a child. The result ends up being exclusion instead of inclusion. 
I have two issues to address with our library. There's just fewer quality books now, which other parents have done a great job of addressing, and a lack of services that represent our demographics. I think the moment when I put my finger on why I'm reluctant to set my younger child free in the library was seeing a generous amount of media with gender, queer, and so on themes, and not seeing the shelves as full of quality books and realizing services are few that reflect the needs of our community here in Goldendale, which tend to be a little different than other communities. I'm concerned books like My Rainbow, this is a book that's being used, um, it's on display. I'm concerned it's a poor Band-Aid being used to stop the bleeding that is a huge social skills casualty among children now. This is a book that's on current display for four to eight-year-olds about a young transgender girl, so a biological boy, with autism and social deficits. While some may make the argument these books are representing a growing community and are needed, I would argue the library is actually helping to grow this sexuality-based ideology geared towards children with social deficits and is aiding in the deaths of childhoods that are free from adult cares. Instead, what a community like Goldendale needs are services and books that speak to our actual demographics. Goldendale's a poverty-dense city with few resources to give hope and encouragement to children with typical development and a dearth of services and supports to the many children here with social development issues. Let's bring in services that address this massive resource gap here in Goldendale. One idea is bringing in adults with speech therapy expertise who will facilitate weekly social skills groups and help children build those social skills muscles. Thank you. Dr. Curtis, Michaela Wood. Well, thank you all for coming and visiting, um, especially all you coming from Vancouver. I really appreciate you making the time to come out here to Goldendale. Um, as someone who's always loved libraries my whole life, um, I remember as a young teenager, I would go to the to the library with my with my mother and our certified therapy dog. We help help the kids read with with the dog. Um, we I as a later on teenager, I would volunteer at the library. Um, when I went to college, I worked at libraries. Libraries are something I've always loved from my earliest times. And I'm really concerned um, here at the Goldendale Library, how we have such a lack of quality books for, um, as many mentioned that homeschooling is significantly lacking in many of the basic books that we need um, for professional books. Um, I've tried to look for several books I needed for my career. Um, I have found one maybe out of the five popular books I've looked up. And even that I had to um, get transferred from another library. It's been very difficult to find books, except for all the pride and LGBT books in the children's section. And I don't know why, in particular, the children's section is the target of all these books, whether it's Pride Month or not, it seems that every almost every book on display is LGBTQ oriented and is talking about sexuality to kids that are, as many mentioned, three, four, five years old. Um, I can't take my daughter to this library. I can't, I can't even come to this library myself without being sickened by how much sexuality is openly shown in a, in a place that is not appropriate for it. And um, this is something that deeply concerns me, deeply, deeply concerns my family. Um, I don't have the books that I need for myself, my family, and I can't take my family here. And I'm very, very saddened as that, by that as someone who's always, always loved libraries. As an Orthodox Christian, I would love to see more of our material. We have a monastery. We have a deep history in this area. I would love to see more appropriate books for this town. Thank you. After Michaela, Patrick Stewart. Hello, thank you for being here. My name is Mika. I live here in Goldendale and I am a wife, a homeschooling mom of three kiddos, a former public edu education, poor, former public elementary school teacher. I have degrees in psychology and a master's in education. My earliest childhood memories were weekly Saturday trips to the public library with my family, with our red wagon. We would bring our stack of books back from the past week and load it up with more books for the week ahead. My brothers and I grew up immersed in the love of learning and love of reading, and our library was not a spectacular building like we have here on the outside, but inside it was filled with endless possibilities. As a mom, I want to instill in my children that same sense of wonder and amazement that comes from reading beautiful books. I truly enjoy many of the wonderful community activities that are planned by our staff here in Goldendale, and I'm so appreciative of all these experiences for my kiddos. 
However, during the entire month of June, the library is not a safe place for me to take my children. The book displays in the children's section for Pride Month are absolutely inappropriate for children of all ages. I understand that a small group of people will see this display and feel seen or affirmed or welcomed at the library, but these books are available throughout the year for them to check out. The very fact that these books are available in the library should be enough for this group of people to feel affirmed. Why are these books on display? Why do librarians feel the need to push these alternative lifestyles on a majority of people, most of whom disagree with them? I would like our, children, our library to be a place of beauty, not just on the outside, but on the inside too. A place where kids can come and grab a book off the table in the kids section that does not contain nudity, images of men dressed as women, and adults and minors participating in sexual acts. These books are not age appropriate to be displayed where children can have access to them. It's almost summer. We live in a wonderful town with lots of outdoor adventures available. Why can we not have on display in the children's section local flowers or fish, a display about camping or enjoying the outdoors? These topics would be appropriate for all ages and make our library a safe place for everyone to come and experience the same sense of wonder and amazement that I felt as a child visiting the library every week. Thank you. After Patrick, Mike Todd. Thank you for the opportunity to come and speak. And is, am I heard out there? You, okay, all right. <clears throat> the purpose of the anus is to expel excrement and not to receive a foreign object into it. That would be a perversion. Yet that is how two gay men do sex. It is licentious and debaucherous. Our public library is promoting this activity by displaying grooming materials much in the same way a pedophile grooms his victims for his crime through so-called children's books written by those who promote the activity I just mentioned. Little innocent children have no interest in sexual activity unless they have been abused in some way by others. It makes no sense to include LGBTQ plus recruiting materials in the little children's section of the library unless it is the objective of the library leadership to influence or groom innocent children for the LGBTQ plus lifestyle. We who hold to traditional family values feel our library is no longer a safe environment for our children and grandchildren. We pay for the library through our property taxes. We also vote on levies. A continuance of this unsafe practice will have an influence on how we choose to vote regarding support of the library in the future. If the materials in question are not removed from the children's section, then we will have no choice but to boycott and abandon our library. I sent an email to the board. I'm not convinced that the board received it. So I have copies for you of that and the response from the director, and I would like it to be distributed to all of you. After Mike Todd, Shelley Westland. Hello, um, my name is Mike Todd. I'm an Orthodox Christian. I'm a father, a homeschooling father, although my wife deserves a credit there of nine. And uh, I was a firefighter in Seattle for 29 years. And I respectfully request that you stop destroying our culture with these books. It's not just the books, it's the ideology. Everybody in here, we're all kind of playing a game, right? We've got different camps. Clearly, you've heard from the Orthodox Christian side, so... I'm expecting some displays there coming up because we've had a pretty good presence. I'd also like to say that we, I love drag queens. I love gay people. I love everybody. Yet, if I go to my priest, Father John, and I'm doing something that is detrimental to myself and my future, my soul, my family, as Orthodox Christians, we define love as union with Christ. So anything that's going to get in the way of that, if I go to my priest in confession, he's going to do everything he can to stop, get me to stop doing that. 
that's love. When we encourage detrimental behavior to our community and we choose, I did a Google search, there are roughly over 135,000, 135 million books that we have to choose from. And we choose these very specific books that lower the bar for our culture, it does us no good. Seattle, Portland, I grew up on the West Coast. We are destroying our cities. I can tell you unequivocally, 100% guarantee from being in Seattle for 29 years and watching that city from the inside, having a key to the city metaphorically, this ideology will only destroy our culture. Shall we enter a written comment? Are you interested in speaking? I just found out about this um, meeting tonight just about an hour before I came. So I apologize for coming so unprofessional. I'm in my work clothes. I'm a small rancher here in this community and I have a son who's 17. And I just wanna say that um, those of us, many of us here, we don't really understand why there's other people speaking so much from other areas. This is our library, is how we feel. Um, although I do realize that this is a Vancouver library area and reaches a lot of people, we're asking you, this board, to consider our library and our needs here. We're also asking, my son's 17, and he's here in the audience, and he said to me, Mom, I think it's ridiculous we're even having to have a meeting like this. It's common sense that young children should not be exposed to these things. I have many friends that are of many different genders and I'm not prejudiced against anyone, but it is clear that there is an agenda. There's definite pressure and inappropriate materials being circulated throughout this library. We're asking you to please stop this. Please listen to the young mothers and fathers of this community that have children and want to be able to use this library safely. Want it to be a haven, a place of true education, of positive resources. Please listen to their plea. Thank you so much for coming and for letting us all speak. Thank you. Um, that's the end of the list of everyone who signed up. Does anyone, we still have, yeah, we still have time. Does anyone wish to make a comment at this time? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I just say your name and uh, just your name is fine. Thank you. My last name is Good Pastor. Uh, I can say that a lot of people here, good intentioned, well intentioned people, are under the illusion that you can meet the left halfway. Could you, you address the board, please, and not the audience? Oh. Thank you so much. I appreciate oh, oh, okay. it. And I'm wondering why the board is not required to, res to respond directly to questions. And they simply sit there like the city council and other uh, entities do. So are you guys restricted from, from conversing or answering questions? This uh, is your time to address the board. We oh, want to okay. hear what you're saying. Well, I, yeah. I can tell you the only option, the only option that's been given to us, strictly speaking, is the removal of people, half of this group, as I understand it, that push this stuff as a false religion. And that is the only remedy for this type of thing is their removal from their position due to, hey, be quiet. Excuse me, please. So we do have to follow our no, guidelines that were laid that. out ahead of There time. is no decorum okay. in this library. Please, if you see the sir, stuff I'm seeing. Right? Please either address the board or sit down. Okay, well, all right, I'll address the board then, specifically you, is there is no remedy for what's going on that these people are delivering to little kids. 
the only remedy is to remove them as soon as possible and replace them with people who have character. So that's it. Okay. May I may I give you guys something? Um, you can hand to Amelia. She'll make sure that we get a copy. She does. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wished to make three? Okay, so we'll alternate. We'll take one virtual and then one in person after that. Thank you. We'll take just a one moment break here to get this sorted out. Could you please step outside so we can continue public comment, please? I see you back there. One moment, please. Thank you. Okay, we can go ahead with one online comment if you have the timer, please. Daryl J. Johns, please go ahead. Daryl, you're muted if you're talking. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can, please go. Okay. Well, I just want to express my comments without going through all the stuff everybody else has. But I do agree with one thing. Uh, drag queen hour, uh, sexually explicit materials, books, et cetera, do not belong in the library, do not belong in the school system. Uh, I don't know where we are going in this country, but I tell you, it's downhill on an astronomical speed. Uh, I will not uh, no longer let my grandchildren go to the library, check out anything because I don't know what's sitting in there. And I can't obviously go through every single book to make sure that it's appropriate. We got to get away from trying to indoctrinate our children, especially you know, hearing stories of people saying that their kid told them what they wanted to be at six months old, impossible. If the kid can do that, then obviously they are a genius. Anyway, uh, to make it short, like I say, uh, I do not want my tax dollars being used to fund like this kind of a program, this $7.5 million. It's ridiculous. Uh, this ideology is not ideology, it's stupidity of what you're trying to do. Uh, and I, like some others, wish it would stop and stop now. Thank you. Thank you. Sir in the back, did you wanna make a comment? Go ahead and come on up, thank you. Just say your name when you get to the microphone. I'm David Jennings. Uh, I wasn't intending to speak. I was a little nervous. So, uh, but since there is a, a little bit of time, uh, I have a the my first thought in hearing all this is, um, you as the board make decisions about what is acceptable and not acceptable to be on display all the time. Uh, you, I doubt if you would uh, put Hustler magazine or something out uh, for display or. Uh, other kinds of pornographic materials. So deciding what is appropriate and was not appropriate is part of what you do. Uh, so two questions I would ask. One is, if the material that is out on display were heterosexual sex, would that be appropriate to have out on display? Not thinking about what they are, but just the content. 
And the other is, what does it mean to have it out on a central display where people, where children go by? Usually if something's on a central display that says, this is important, look at it. We think that this is something you need to know about. Um, is that really what you want to say to the four or five-year-olds that are coming in? So that's basically, I just wanted you to think, think about that as you're making your decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Are there, you said there were more online? Okay. Okay, Evan Axon, please go ahead. Yes, hi. Um, <clears throat> sorry, my name is Evan Axon. Um, I am a Vancouver resident. I frequent the Cascade Highlands um, library frequently with my two-year-old daughter. Um, and I just want to say thank you for providing her with books. Uh, thank you so much. I really just like, I can't, I can't talk about, you know, I know I can't talk to other people in the audience, but you know, my two-year-old does not go to the library uh, and, and go to a certain section and think that all of the things are meant for her and all the things are uh, her things for her to do. Um, I, my, my child understands that she reads the books that she wants to read. And I just want to say thank you to this board uh, for, for allowing her to have access to a representative and inclusive selection of books um, that tells her that if she wants to learn about something, she is able to do so. Um, that is like, you know, the, the decision to take books out of circulation um, is a ban. It is a ban. It should be called as such. And I don't think that that's what uh, this library and the people in this community are asking for. I don't think that this is what we should be doing. Um, we should be providing information that is the point of the library to find out more about things and that is what i want my child and my future children to do and that is what i want my community to stand up for is the ability to access as much information as possible um, when they want to with the help of the board uh, it is not my job to go through every single book in the library and figure out what i like that is why you are there and i just want to express my appreciation for you doing your job um, and you know, providing this service to the public that uh, without, you know, sorry, that's that's my time. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, please say your name for us. Thank you. And they put a microphone in front of me. No, uh, my name is Mark Sigfornius, and I've lived in Goldendale for 32 years, so I am still a, a, people from the West Side. So, uh, I've seen a lot of things in my life. I was a police officer for 22 years. Um, then we moved over here after I was injured. And it just kind of gets down to this. Uh, what our children, everybody here has seen things, both good and bad, that you never forget. Never forget it. It just come, I mean, I've, been to accidents where it was way before the even the jaws of life were even invented where you just couldn't get people out of the car before it started burning i've got some burns on my hands from trying to do that i mean you see things and it just doesn't it's always on your mind not necessarily all the time but it always comes back, whether it's good or bad. Well, we need to protect our children from seeing things they don't need to see. It's just, it's just something that they that live with you for the for the rest of their lives. And if they see inappropriate things, such as the books that were displayed, it, it's going to be with them for the rest of their life, and that's our fault. It's not. It, it, I'm not against the, you know, you know, burn the books and all that other kind of stuff. And it's just the fact that we need to be seriously aware of what they get to see. And if that's, this is what they see, this is what they're going to remember for the rest of their life. So um, thank you for coming all the way 
down from Vancouver, and most of you, and um, um, I know your yeah, the, the the board is it's a it's a tough board to be on, especially for all the money you make doing it. That's <laughs> yeah yeah. So thank you so much for for coming down here and and uh, allowing us to speak. Thanks. Thank you. Was there another online? Okay, Laura Thayer, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Laura Thayer. I teach at Golden Hill High School. I just I've been listening a lot, and I understand that some people are concerned. But um, I also just wanted to point out that in the school system, we see kids and people from all all walks of life, all types of people, and we may not always see that in other places. Um, and I wanted to to mention that I've read a lot of books that have uh, trans and gay and all kinds of representations of different kinds of people, and they're not graphically represented. It would have a character in the book where, you know, their crush is a boy instead of a girl or the other way around, and it just shows another life. It doesn't go into detail and try to make people change their mind about things, except for the idea, and someone pointed this, this out earlier, with the idea of no shame and that people can have love for each other and caring. And I feel like a lot of comments tonight seem like they're against people. And even if we say, well, I'm not this or I'm not that, when, when we wanna take away those things that represent somebody else, it, it feels to me like that really is maybe what we're saying. So I feel it's important that everyone has books to represent them, whether it's race, sexuality. I mean, obviously we don't want pornography and we don't want kids you know being told this is what you're supposed to be or do or any of that but I I just challenge people to read more books and to learn more about people and you know most of us haven't had a chance to step out of our own lifestyle to to see others and I feel like in the school system we we see more of that and so I just want to speak for the the kids at school and make sure that we don't take things away from them that they might want and need thank you Thank you. Was there anyone else who wished to make comment? We have a few more minutes left. Are we at an hour? Isn't it been an hour? Okay. All right, well, that concludes uh, public comments. Um, I do have, uh, is there just one more? Just one more? Okay, we'll take just one more. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Isaac Stewart. So I grew up in California uh, near LA. I had lots of friends that were in the LGBTQ movement. And um, what I observed each and every time is it left them feeling more broken than they were when they entered it. They, uh, they tried entering the movement to find happiness and to make themselves feel fulfilled. And each and every time they, they left feeling worse than they were before, so. I don't know, that brokenness that they all felt, I just really think we shouldn't be pushing that towards other children. We shouldn't be leading them towards something that will make them much worse than they were before. But yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for your comments. Um, now we'll go to the board if they have any comments or questions about things. Um, does anyone have anything they wanted to talk about, ask? Um, I actually do have um, my own, if no one else has one. It's about a written comment that we received. Um, well, first, I, Amelia, how many um, book challenges would you say you received in the last year? We received eight in 2022. And how many of those challenges resulted in physically taking a book out of circulation? Zero. So you're not seeing banning of books? That's correct. Um, my other question is about the email that discussed um, FVRL supported drag queen Zoom event. Is that something that happened and can we learn more about that? No, we did not okay. uh, participate in that event. Okay, thank you very much. Does anyone else have questions or comments? Question. Hey everybody, my name is Olga Lukomsky Hodges. I'm the um, representative for Click Attack County and specifically this library. And I just want to thank each and every one of you for showing up tonight. This is a huge turnout for Goldendale. This is like a uh, music festival size for us. So thank you so much. Um, 
everybody that took time to come out and listen and um, just share where you're at because it's important. This library is here for our community. Um, whatever it is that you have to say, it is to be received respectfully and 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 you know taken seriously. And so um, I'm deeply moved to see this turnout. Um, I am so honored to be able to serve you specifically. Thanks so much, Christ Conquers. The Fort Vancouver Regional Library District Board of Trustees will now meet in executive session to discuss personnel as allowed by RCW 423110. The Board of Trustees will be in, exe in executive session until, do you want to say 745? Until 745 p.m. Um, the Board of Trustees is not expected to take further action following the exec uh, following the executive session. Thank you all.
Like, that's cool.
and giving everybody a few minutes to get back in their seats and then we'll start again. We're gonna call the regular meeting back to order. We met for 30 minutes on personnel and no action was taken. Next, we're gonna move on to reports. First up is organizational and strategic plan report from the admin team. Good evening, board. Uh Sorry, got a little too close to that. Um, so uh, every quarter we give you an update on how things are going um, in the organization. Um, and I've included a little note here um, that um, I thought was just indicative of uh, some of the things we received in our branches. So this is hi, Beth. I just wanted to say thank you for your help in getting me books. Um, and now, of course, I can't read that. By mail, thank you. It is a pleasure to find someone like you in the public service. I am 100 years old and need a lot of help. So just as a reminder, we have a books by mail program. And in this particular case, um, Beth is one of our uh, now collection development librarians, but she was working in uh, Telinfo, so reference on, on the phone. And this patron had called in and said that she wasn't physically able to get to the library anymore, but still wanted to get books. And so she set up her books by mail. Um, Dave Josephson could not be with us this evening, but he wanted to share um, a few things about what's going on. Uh, there are pictures here of our new um, office space, um, and I'm not sure if um, the board is aware, but we uh, have delayed the move into the building until the first week of August, um, primarily because we don't have door frames uh, for our interior doors, and they're required for fire code, um, but pretty much everything else is on track. Um, you can see there the women's restroom. Um, in the top picture, um, 
There is a um, view of the kitchen. That's the staff break room. You can kind of see the cabinets and things in there. Um, on the lower level, looking down one of the hallways, you can see that we have accent uh, kind of turquoise blue walls here and there without in, within the building. Another view of the women's restroom, kind of the wall behind the sink. Um, our main entry area, we have a big kind of bookcase there, and that's where we'll have a reception desk. And then looking south, that's the great big room where our technical services uh, group will be um, have their desks. So um, go on to the next one, if you would. Um, so Woodland right now, that project is out for bid. Uh, we did a site walk on June 14th, and we had about 30 people come. So we had a very good turnout from interested contractors. That bid opening will be July 10th at 2 p.m. And then hopefully we'll be able to bring to the board um, a, a contractor, hope the go ahead on negotiating a contract uh, with our low bidder on July 17th. Um, Goldendale has had a landscape refresh. Um, they're adding some lighting uh, to help light the collections in the um, kind of mid-level of the building in our adult section. Um, and we're adding a new fence between us and the neighbors to the west. Cascade Park is getting sound panels on the walls, courtyards getting completed. Um, Three Creeks is getting LED light upgrade in their entry. Stevenson has new doors coming and a new garage motor for the bookmobile. Uh, was not a plan, but it happened. Um, and then our Vancouver library, we're creating a maker space and a former media lab. And so we're getting cabinets and a sink put in there. And then we just replaced the entry gates, um, grates, excuse me. Um, that's one of the reasons Dave isn't here is he worked yesterday um, helping install some new um, metal grates at, at the entry and then Ridgefield is getting sound panels in their meeting room. All right, Lynn. How about this? <laughs> Good evening. Uh, my name is Lynn Caldwell and I'm re representing Collection and Technology Services. So I wanted to talk to you about a couple things this evening, um, IT and circulation, which are parts of my division as well. We talk about books a lot, but I also have these two areas uh, under my purview as well. So Mike Smetana over here, who's helping us with these board meetings, has done a super great job, and he's one of our IT specialists. And so I just wanted to thank him uh, here for doing all his work. Yay, Moss. Uh, he likes to be called Moss. Anyway. <laughs> Um, so he's one of our IT specialists. We have uh, Mike, Aaron, Jad, and John, and we recently hired help desk staff so that these guys can maintain doing higher level things and not get interrupted by turn it off and turn it back on. <laughs> Is it plugged in? <laughs> you know, so <laughs> reboot. So we're really excited to have help desk staff um, with us now. Uh, and then I also wanted to follow up at the last board meeting, I believe it was in Stevenson, you guys passed a resolution to give 18-year-olds uh, a clean slate. So um, our systems manager, Brenda Cameron, has just finished going through, she had a whole process, she had to see who has turned 18 in the last six years, because we remove bills for everyone after six years, the state auditor considers those uncollectible debt. So, um, and, but not only had they turned 18, but also the bill that was on their account was from before they were 18. So it was a whole formula she had to do. It took her a little while, but she got it all done. And that resulted in removing 1,100-ish uh, bills, uh, accounts that had bills. And 60% of those accounts only had one bill that was keeping a kid from using the library. And Susan, the circulation supervisor here at Goldendale, while Brenda was in this process, uh, she hadn't gotten to everybody yet, and Susan had a kid in front of her who had turned 18 recently, and so she called Brenda and asked, you know, what can I do? And so Brenda and Jewel, our circulation uh, circulation coordinator, <laughs> get the right word, um, they helped Susan uh, get this person cleared on the spot um, and, and was able to go home with some books, and that person was very excited. So, so it's, it's definitely been beneficial already. Um, that's it for me. All right, tech. Evening board and um, patrons. Um, I wanted to just, since we're in um, Goldendale, I wanted to uh, focus a little bit on some of the stuff that we've been doing um, in this community and in Klickadat and Skamania County, sort of focus a little bit of, of our upper ranches. So one of the first things you'll see is um, We've been doing our news and events calendar for the last about eight months, I think it's been. Um, this month, for the first time, we have split them. So um, there's a Clark County edition and a Skamania and Klickitat edition. 
Um, this was sort of always part of our intention. Um, but to begin with, we we were still ramping up all of our programs with the summer starting. Um, we wanted to do that. And part of this also, um, which I think I can probably get um, support from Ruth for sure and Tara, and I know David and Stevenson as well, um, we're including the bookmobile schedules, um, which was which was one of the the, the things that we were asked a lot about. Um, we've also uh, got community reads coming up in October. Ruth said something about the books coming out next month. Um, so that's in White Salmon. Skimania County reads just ended, um, and um, this is this year marks the 50th anniversary of Click It Out County joining FBRL. Um, so we've been doing a uh, we've been supporting um, a series of things that Ruth and Tara will be doing to support that both in the two locations as well as on the bookmobile. And that's all I've got for you. Thank you. Good after, good evening board. Um, just a quick list of accomplishments and upcoming highlights for us. Um, in preparation for bargaining with WPEA, the Public Employee Relations Commission came out and did uh, some training with both bargaining, bargaining teams, um, assisting with the executive director recruitment. We're implementing process improvements to HR payroll processing. Um, we have some upcoming recruitments uh, for key positions, the uh, branch manager three at VA and several other uh, librarian positions, and then uh, senior library assistants. Distance. And then we have been using the um, equity lens to, to evaluate our PSA recruitment process, and we've been um, incrementally making some changes to that over the last three months. Coming up this summer, we'll be doing a career fair at Employment Security in August. Um, we have implementation of 2023 wage and salary increases for WPEA, AFSCME, and non-represented regular employees on July 1st. It's a 2.5% increase. And the Washington Cares Fund, um, which is Washington State's long-term care insurance program, uh, employee and employer, uh, I'm sorry, employee contributions resume July 1st. And that's it for us. Thanks, Lee. All right, Ruth. I didn't know I was supposed to talk. Oh, hi, I'm Ruth Schaefer. I am the uh, Acting Public Services Director. I'm also the White Salmon Valley Community Library, which is the other library in Klickitat County. Uh, so thank you, Olga, for uh, representing us as well. Um, I just wanted to uh, highlight that we're moving into summer reading, but I think Justin's going to talk about that. No, uh, we are moving into summer reading. Uh, the, the public service librarians across the district have been spending the last uh, month to six weeks heading out to the schools to um, encourage people to sign up for our summer reading program. Uh, you can see the adorable bookmark that's there. Um, I'm not really sure which library that... Um, the yellow banner is, I think that's Vancouver actually, where they're creating um, a reading game at their library. You can go to the next slide. Uh, in the past uh, six weeks or so across the district, we've been doing a variety of programs called Welcome to America. Um, there were several initiatives um, as part of this. One of them was a grant that we received uh, pre-pandemic uh, from the Yiddish Book Club. Uh, which allowed us to do uh, three different book discussion groups on uh, the immigrant experience uh, focused from uh, the New York Jew experience, um, landing in uh, three different time periods in New York City and, and what immigration was like. Uh, we were able to have uh, three hybrid book discussion groups about that and had a lively discussion. It was really nice. Um, we, in May, our um, Book display was the Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. So every month we highlight a particular <clears throat> group, a marginalized group or uh, a group of uh, heritage diversity and pride of all kinds. So that was last month. Uh, next month we'll be doing disability awareness. Uh, so that's what our uh, display will be next month. Um, you can also see the slide to the on the bottom on the left is this wonderful set of picture books that was circulating throughout our 
district at many of the branches. And these books were all designed to be read while in the library. They're all basically reference books, uh, but they are all picture books that are designed for adults to read with children to open the conversation about immigration and the immigrant experience and, and what that like, what's that like for both the immigrant and for those of us welcoming immigrants to America. Um, and we held several uh, programs across the district where we read those books out loud to adults and hosted discussion. Um, we also hosted a discussion, it's kind of cut off the Reflecting Rainbow LBTGQ+. Uh, we held um, a uh, Zoom online uh, program on the uh, LBTGQ immigrant experience, which is, um, of course, adds another layer of complexity to them joining America. Uh, that's all for that slide. And there's one more slide. Yeah, and I just wanted to highlight a variety of different ways that we're connecting with youth. Uh, the middle one is story time in the park in White Salmon. There's children um, on the top left. They're uh, learning about the AMH machine, which is the uh, book sorter uh, at the Battle Crown Library. And you can just see that the kids are really enjoying themselves both inside and outside. And uh, somebody, I don't know which library had the stormtroopers there, but that's just yet another way for us to engage with children. Um, any questions for me? Please do. The um, Stevenson friends had 61 attendees at Reptiles and Reptile Man. Oh, excellent. I didn't, I didn't have a picture of that, but um, bringing in live animals to the libraries always brings in a good crowd. But 61 people in Stevenson, that's something to be proud of. Thank you. <laughs> I wouldn't have gotten her out of the state. <laughs> Justin. Good evening, board, community members, FVRL staff members out there, wherever you are. Um, the Reptile Man is performing tomorrow at Washougal at 430. End of report. Um, this photo, um, Outreach and Community Partnerships Division staff, Jackie and Di Diane, have been making regular visits to the um, Veterans Hospital in Vancouver over the last few months. These visits have given residents an opportunity to get hands-on with some of our 3D printers. After a few weeks of design, measurement, prototyping, this young man in the photo printed his own coffee cup holder for his wheelchair. Once the final product, Jackie and Diane will continue making these visits because they now have a short line of people that would like to explore printing their own assistive devices. Um, volunteers, I oversee outreach and programming, volunteers and reference services. So for our volunteer coordinator, Sherry Braga, she's been very busy the last couple of months coordinating large volunteer groups to come in and help with our Summer at Your Library program. You can go ahead to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so in the last two months, we had groups from IQ Credit Union, Hewlett Packard, and Invest West Management provide 63 volunteers, giving 160 hours to prepare us for the Summer at Your Library program. That top left picture is a picture of all the grand prize baskets for all ages that have gone out to every location. I'd like to thank the foundation for their um, support of the grand prizes this year. Our reference services team has successfully onboarded 10 new staff and substitute staff members through the many hour long reference training that is required from all of our staff. And so I did want to mention that the Revolutionary Reads Program 2023 has concluded. 700 copies of Atomic Days by Josh Frank were distributed, again, thanks to the foundation. Um, this year's Rev Reads came about a little bit differently. We had some additional programming beyond the author visit in the book discussion. And Jamie Bear, our outreach and program coordinator for adults, really took it to heart to try to bring in other groups into the conversations for the programs. So they were able to have programs presented by WSU Tri-Cities, the Washington Department of Ecology, the Columbia River Keepers, and the um, Yakima Nation, and they were able to help. They co-created the programming alongside of us. Um, I'll skip summary at your library. So between March and May, FVRL was at over 100 outreach community events around the district. 
June and July, we're starting to really heat up in outreach. So we work with community partners of all stripes all throughout the district to bring our summer at your library program to kids everywhere. So for summer at your library, we are supporting six ESD 112 day camps around the district. We are supporting Clark County and Vancouver Parks and Recs at six of their day camps. We are doing summer at your library promotions at low income housing complexes. We are right now, well, not right now, we are working with partners and careers to support or to train um, Ukrainian refugees on how to use the library and access our resources. I'm getting all over the map, now I'm skipping parts. Um, and this summer we are working with Share House again to provide summer meals at two of our Vancouver locations. This year we were able to bring Cascade Park Library into the fold for that. So we have them at Vancouver and Cascade Park every day until the end of August. Cascade Park was, I think, a huge, that was an area that Cher has had trouble connecting with um, people that need their services the most. So thanks to the staff at Cascade Park, we were able to expand what we can do in the area of summer meal sites. And I think that's it for me now. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. How do libraries partner with um, meal charities? So we work specifically with Share House in Vancouver. They are a designated by the FDA avenue for summer meals to be delivered to kids. Okay. So we work with them. They provide our staff training. They bring the meals. Our staff just manage the, the crowd, handing out the food and keeping statistics for share house so then they can report back to the fda is there anything in Kukatak county that we're doing with that no okay um do we have any opportunities to do that let me get back to you on that yes we do but it is hi ruth Yeah, I'd be honored to do that. We have a lot of um, good resources here locally in town. Um, high poverty rate here. I mean, you know, how that goes. Kids get free lunches and then it goes away in the summer. So um, there's some places that are facilitating that um, locally, but um, I think we do have some opportunities here specifically. Good to know. Thank you, Olga. Thanks. Any other questions? Yes. Next, we'll move on to Goldendale Community Library with Tara McLeod. No. Check. Yeah. See, I, I used to use a, a microphone all the time in one of my last jobs. So I love microphones, but I have to say after two years of giving presentations behind a screen, it's a little easier behind a screen than in front of a whole bunch of people. So um, good evening, board. My name is Tara McLeod. I'm the branch manager here at the Goldendale Community Library, as well as our Click Attack County uh, bookmobile. And this is the first time I've met some of you in person. So it's really great to meet you. And thank you all for making the trek all the way out here. Um, as you know, I gave you about a year and a half of a presentation about six months ago. So hooray, this is going to be very short and sweet. All right, yes. <laughs> uh, next slide. So I always like to start out with our gold team. Uh, success of our services is all because of our gold team, the Friends of the Golden Dale Library and volunteers, as well as a wonderful community who visit us with smiles, goodwill, and sometimes chocolate. Next slide. 
All right. So uh, we have brought programs back for all ages. Uh, Crafternoon and Lego Builder programs are always a cloud, crowd pleaser, as are performers and art workshops uh, for adults. And uh, you can see all the different programs that we have there. And we'll move on to where are you going? <laughs> and there's my presentation. <laughs> I know I even had statistics in there. Okay, so we are one more. Yes. All right. So since November, we are continuing to build partnerships with other organizations and groups. Uh, we tried partnering or participating in the Goldendale Winter Bazaar at the Grange with a gingerbread house contest, and it was judged by city council members Dave Jones, Phil Ontiveros, and Ellie Casey. Uh, which you can see on the bottom left uh, resulted in uh, an interesting picture. It was a little uh, humid in the room, so our only submission for the gingerbread house collapsed. But they won all of the prizes and the trophies that were 3D printed. So, um, And then you can see uh, I did actually get to go to the Lamboree this year, which is a first. I mean, I was kind of a city girl before moving here, so it's it's always great to be able to get out there and and be the librarian in residence at something like the like the Lamboree. And uh, we do have a few uh, backpacks with portable telescopes. I'm still working with TSD to see the best way to be able to distribute those into the community. And that was through the NASA at My Library uh, grant that we got my first year here. And uh, that is Adrienne, who is doing story time over at the Home and Garden Show. And she's been doing phenomenally well, both with teens, teens and kids. Next slide. All right, so on the top left, you can see a very big group of uh, teens, and that's a local D&D &D group. Uh, tends to wax and wane with school sports and uh, clubs and activities. Um, but it was the spark that we were looking for to create a teen council as well as a teen wellness series. And that was actually really well attended, and we were able to partner with uh, different community organizations around town. Um, so let's see, I'm losing, losing my place too. Uh, Goldendale hosted this year's Revolutionary Reads author talk, and so, of course, coming from my brain, we had to get some atomic cupcakes, and so those are actually uh, atomic cupcakes on the bottom left that we got through Cafe Genevieve, and they glow in under a uh, black light, and our author was very excited about it. And also randomly, you can see on the uh, the right hand pictures, uh, some lovely young patrons uh, bought our staff ice cream and then just recently brought us cupcakes. So next slide. All right, so uh, we partnered with the Art at the Heart of Goldendale, a chamber committee promoting public art. If you haven't seen the murals over uh, off of Main Street in Columbus, I highly suggest driving by, they're beautiful. Uh, but this time in uh, November, we uh, decided to create a scarecrow village throughout Goldendale because we are uh, an agricultural community. And of course, the weather wasn't as welcoming as we had hoped. So you can see on the top right, uh, some of them didn't last very long, but the one over at the police department and at City Hall did. So that was that was a lot of fun that we probably won't do again. <laughs> it's the scarecrows are hard. Next slide. All right, so our friends group who uh, hosted our, our refreshments uh, today uh, has had a revival with new volunteers and new ideas and how to support the library and the community. They held a boutique book sale and holiday party to celebrate all of the friends and welcome community members to participate as they browse the special collection during the, that winter uh, sale. And there were crafts, munchies, and of course, hot chocolate. And then in April for National Library Week and Library uh, Workers Day, the friends gifted all staff uh, with a new gift each day of the week. Everyone truly felt appreciated and very grateful. And then uh, on the top right, just have to highlight that we did receive a new microfilm reader uh, and it should improve the user experience while researching. Next slide. Mm -hmm. All right, so as you know, the Klickitat County Bookmobile covers about 1,500 square miles serving central and eastern Klickitat County. 
And we started a new service of Saturday visits with a craft last fall and continued this spring. And we partnered with schools and community centers to host the craft while we've uh, also providing a Saturday bookmobile stop. So people unable to visit during our, our usual stops were able to enjoy the service. And there were many new visitors to the bookmobile as well as to the craft sessions. Many asked when the next uh, Saturday visit would be. So we will be continuing those in the fall. And we are also continuing to visit festivals and fairs with the, in the county uh, and schools, such as the Klickitat Schools Pirate Carnival, which you can see in the bottom in the middle. Um, Adrian decided to dress up like a pirate as well. And next slide. All right, so uh, we had a pleasant surprise at the annual candy cane parade in Goldendale, as it was the first time the bookmobile had placed in the parade. Uh, and uh, we really do think it was because of our, our mascot, which is a jackalope. <laughs> and uh, we're also continuing the passive programs for young patrons who only visit the bookmobile. So you can see that in the, in the bottom uh, picture, they were writing about what they love about books and the bookmobile and um, things like that. And then I also wanted to share a first for me, uh, something you can only really experience in a rural community, and that's having to pause while driving the bookmobile due to a cattle drive. So you can see that they were coming towards us and then that beautiful bull, he just kept watching us and side eyeing us, making sure that like, you know, we stayed in our bookmobile. So that was a lot of fun. All right, next slide. And we all love statistics at some time, so I thought I would try. And I uh, tracked circulation for the spring for the past seven years. Um, you can kind of see where the green one is. That's when we closed for the pandemic. Um, the blue line, uh, we're kind of gaining. We're still in the middle for the library, but we've almost reached uh, and surpassed our highest peak of circulation for the bookmobile. And we do attribute that to adding a second staff member back to the bookmobile, as well as working with schools for the schedule and uh, making sure that our stops are more visible. Um, and of course, I don't know if you can see, uh, but in April, in an all years, there's a lull. So I believe that's a pretty good correlation to gardening enthusiasts. Yeah. All right. Next slide. And I think you all have seen this, our, our wonderful list of community partnerships that we work with um, throughout the county as well as within the district. And... Yes, so uh, TAC did ta talk about this. What One of our projects we're doing is recording stories about community members and their experience with the library through the last 50 years. And the couple that we already recorded, we're not ready yet. So please stay tuned. Hopefully we'll have those on social media soon. Okay. And that's it. Thank you. Short and sweet. Questions? No? Did you have a question? Yeah. Hey, Tara. Um, so tonight we heard uh, a variety of comments from the community members. I heard a lot from the homeschool community, and I was wondering if you could um, respond and speak to some of the um, needs as far as materials or anything like that. What, oh, I already what have. We, what are we doing here as far as supporting homeschooling communities? I actually did talk to them, and we're actually going to be working together. I think that having a couple of different displays on classics and, and working with that and making sure that it's timely with their schedule, and they know now that I'm accessible, and I'm also able to give them tours of our online resources, which are really accessible for up-to-date information when kids are researching and need something. Uh, because all of our online resources, they can actually, you know, be used in lieu of a book if you can't get a book. There, there are articles, there's primary resources, secondary resources, and, you know, sometimes you just need somebody there to guide you through it. So I'm, I'm available whenever. Um, I think I have a tour for Lyle Summer School coming up. Any other questions? Not exactly. Um, are you saying you let people know about the tools that we have available and you want to educate them on how to access those tools? Correct. Okay. And Tara, if I understand you correctly, when we took the break, you went out and spoke to people. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I got a list and I got contact info. It was very helpful. Thanks. Thank you. Um, next is April 2023 financial statements with Atar Bengal. Good 
Good evening. Uh, tonight we have the April financials, starting with the statement of cash. Um, hopefully you can see that on the projection. Rhonda, can you um, make that bigger? Oh, Moss, Elizabeth, thank you. <laughs> I wasn't sure. <laughs> All right, so at the end of April, uh, year-to-date revenues were $12.4 million, and year-to-date expenditures $9.8 million, uh, with a cash balance of $23.5 million. And uh, proceeding to the statement of revenues, <clears throat> uh, property tax revenue uh, for April uh, totaled $10.2 million. Uh, Year-to-date is at 44.38% of budget. Um, April uh, leasehold excise tax revenue. <laughs> uh, I think that's, I think that's it. All right, so April uh, leasehold excise tax uh, was $1.3,000. Federal in lieu was um, $10.3,000 and state forest boards, uh, $269. Under other um, charges for services um, uh, for April, that brought in uh, $2.9,000. And then um, under miscellaneous, April investment interest revenue was $36,000. Total April revenue was $10.2 million. Um, year to date budget, per, uh, excuse me, year to date budget percentage uh, for total operating revenue was 39.78%, and total revenue was 36.85%. Uh, and then uh, next we have the statement of expenses. Um, at, the em at the end of April, we would expect um, total expenses for year to date to be um, at or around 33% of budget. Um, April personal costs were $1.4 million, uh, with year-to-date at 31.58% of budget, uh, running lower than budget due to um, 28 open positions. Um, supplies and small equipment uh, for the month of April was $55,000, with year-to-date at 19.8%. April library materials activity was $169,000, um, with year-to-date at 25%. Under uh, other services charges, um, professional service uh, came in at $117,000 with repair and maintenance at $124.7,000. Um, additionally, communication was at $22,000 and utilities at $34,000. Um, both are running higher than budget. Um, capital outlay had $74,000 for buildings owned. Um, total uh, April operating expenditure uh, was at $2.1 million, and grand total expenditures were at $2.4 million for, um, for that month. Um, Year-to-date budget percentage for total expenditures was at 29%. Questions? I do have a question. Um, where does decorations and things like that for different displays, celebrations fall in the budget? Um, that's a good question. Um, Um, so, uh, likely it's, uh, going to come from supplies, um, the supply line, um, it could also be, um, small equipment. So I would, I would say, um, uh, likely, there, sorry, go ahead. but I could always, um, drill down and get you a more specific answer, but I'm thinking, um, just looking at, because these are broad, um, overall financials, um, I'm, I'm thinking small equipment. Yeah, I would be interested to know a little bit more about that and how much we're spending on each type of holiday or whatever. That would be interesting to know. Is there a place I could look for that? Or is that something that is going to... We don't really spend money on we don't. display or, okay. or things. It just If we have is things, it... they might just have the, a, you know, a box full of stuff in the branch that they've used over time. Um, or we, you know, we just print it off. Okay. You know, but we don't really have a line item for display or decor okay. type things. Yeah. <sighs> yes. Sarah says yes. <laughs> Thank you. Does anyone else have questions? 
So, so the pride flags that are currently taped onto pens, like at this library, are those things that are purchased or printed off by staff and put on pens and on displays? Yeah. Next, we'll move on to the consent agenda. I reviewed the expenditures for May and found them to be in order. I also make a motion to approve the consent agenda and minutes. Can you say that on your microphone? I'm sorry. <laughs> Seconded. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? I move this to a vote. Penny Love Hensley? Yes. Marianne Duncan Cole? Yes. Megan Dugan? Aye. Marie Coppy? Yes. Olga Hodges? Aye. Vikram Kawani? Aye. Can't hear you. Aye. Thank you. And Christy Morgan, aye. The motion passes. We'll move on to business first with the Finance Committee 2022 Annual SAO Financial Report. And um, Elizabeth, if you could bring up the staff report, thanks. Actually, um, in the agenda. There's a staff report for the finance committee. Page 22. I think. Is that the one? Yes. There we go. Thank you. Um, so every year we are required to file with the state um, our official uh, financial reports for the prior year, and that's with the state auditor's office. And we work with our CPA firm to um, present these financials. And um, I won't go into great detail here. You have the report. It's essentially a snapshot of last year. Um, and we are required to share this with the board as part of our obligation in open government. Um, it gives you our starting and ending cash. It gives you what was spent during the year um, and what our liabilities are for um, uh, and this is within the report, liabilities are for retirement and for um, sick and vacation leave. Um, Atar, is there anything else you'd want to mention about these reports in terms of? Um, in terms of the financial aid? Yeah. It, it also mentions the, the Vancouver um, Library Capital Facilities Area Bond Debt. Um, which is administered by the Clark County Council. So I also give a copy of that report to them. Um, and then I will send copies of this report to both the Klickitat and Skamania County uh, commissions, um, along with a report of what was spent in their counties as part of um, our report for 2022. Any questions about the annual report? All right, now moving on, if you would, uh, to the slideshow. Thank you. Um, so June is the month where we kick off our next year's budget. <laughs> Yay. Yay. <laughs> so exciting. <laughs> Time for 2024. Uh, it might seem soon since we're just barely into 2023, um, but this is the month where we begin to look at revenues and expenditures for the first half of the year and then consider how that might impact our budget for the following year. Um, in the next, in the coming months, you'll see a whole list of activities that we'll be following month by month. And we do this just to keep the board informed about what steps to expect. Um, July and August are primarily the months where we ask our branches to give us any budget requests they have for the coming year. Um, our division requests are due by the end of September. And then we will have a first reading of the budget to the board in October, a second reading of the budget in November, and a levy public hearing in November. Our levy request is due to the county by the 30th of November by state statute. 
and then the board approves the budget in uh, December. And the other thing that um, is always a factor is whether or not we would need to amend the 2023 budget for any reason. So we'll also keep you informed about that. So just to give you kind of a, a sense of where we are in the year compared to the last couple of years, um, you can see that wages are pretty much where we were in 2022. We're still a little bit below that mark, but um, kind of running parallel to that. And that's because our, our position in terms of having a lot of vacancies hasn't really changed in the last year. We pretty much fill a job and another one empties as someone internally takes that position. So we have a lot of internal uh, movement, um, but not a lot of external hiring um, because almost all of our positions are offered first internally. Um, medical dental life insurance is a little closer to budget. Uh, last year, you can see at 25.22%, I had overestimated it. Um, we had not had the final um, accounting for open enrollment when we set the budget in November. And so um, I put too much money into uh, insurance last year, and that's why that ran a little bit low. This year, we're much closer um, in our estimates. So that's why it's right on budget. And then you can see things like FICA, PERS, workman's comp. Um, unemployment is something we self-insure. So we carry our own unemployment. Um, and that's why at 58%, that just means that's one or two people at most collecting unemployment from us right now. Um, but because it's um, budgeted at $10,000, it adds up pretty quickly. So that's why we're at 58% of that budget. But it's still not a significant amount of money. Um, going on to the next slide. Um, this is our personnel status. So it, as Lee mentioned earlier, we have budgeted for a 2.5% increase on July 1st. Um, in July is also when we get our forecast for 2024 um, benefits. So we'll be talking to our insurance company in the coming month and hearing what we are anticipating may be some bad news. Um, we've been really lucky the last few years with very small increases. And um, we're hearing that that's probably not going to keep going. Um, we'll probably see a bigger bump this year. Um, and then again, empty positions, 23.8 uh, in our public services and 4.2 in our operations. Um, and pretty much any time we have an opening in operations, it gets filled by a public services employee. <laughs> um, if you would, yeah, thanks, go back one. So operational expenses, um, again, looking at year to date on budget. Um, Lynn left, and so I can't answer this question. Um, but right now, technology spending looks behind, but that's because we just have a very long lead time on orders. Um, we are we do have orders in, we just haven't received them or needed to pay for them yet. Um, everything else is coming fairly close to budget. Um, fuel is actually slightly ahead of budget, but because it's combined with supplies, that's brought that number down. Um, but I've been really watching the fuel numbers um, simply because the cost of it is so high right now. And some things like uh, e-resources can kind of ebb and flow since we pay an annual subscription to a lot of those. There are months where we just have to pay them and so that, that budget isn't necessarily as illustrative of actual spending. Go on the next one. And then finally, uh, things like professional services is still a little low this year, which is great. Communications, which is our internet, our broadband access, um, and telephone service, travel and training. Um, that, again, can skew a little bit simply because we may send some people to a conference and that might bump that number up a bit um, in, the, in the short term, but might not be indicative of the overall spending. Um, advertising is pretty low right now. Um, summers of time, we do a lot of that. Um, and insurance, um, the insurance um, uh, renewals just came in, so you're going to see that go way up. It'll go to almost 100% <laughs> um, because we pay it all at once, uh, once a year. And then capital expenses, um, pretty much going right on budget. Um, we, um, of course, this year are really much more aggressively spending our capital. We're finally getting rolling on our own operations center and, and soon we'll be working on the Woodland building. Um, so that's good. And then finally, uh, this is really small, so it's gonna be hard to see, but this is just our five year look ahead. Um, and I you know, just kind of wanna remind you, um, we're always kind of thinking in the future, not just about this year's budget, but in those future budgets and really kind of project out. And I still am carrying the potential for some um, debt service out there um, starting in 2025, um, just if we are able to get funding for Washougal. Do you have any questions for me about the budget? Is um, the cost of a recruiter something that we just absorb into the professional, or has that been kind of put in there? It's We can absorb it within our professional services category. Okay. Um, we had a couple of things, like um, we had budgeted for a 
uh, strategic facility study this year that we're not doing, which gives us some capacity um, for that. And um, so I, 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 it's, yeah, it's well within what we have. Thank you. Other questions? We'll move on to policy committee, library internet use and safety policy first reading. Thank you. So um, I'm gonna clip this so I can see it. Um, Elizabeth, could you bring that up for me? So the library district already has a library internet use policy and we have ascribed to um, the Children's Internet Protection Act or SIPA for some years, which requires us to um, filter our internet computers in the library. Um, recently, we were asked to ensure that our policy covered internet safety for minors as part of our obligation um, under SIPA um, and our E-rate funds that we receive. And so you'll see some new language in this policy. Um, it's in red and it's specific to um, ensuring that we are communicating with the public through our policies that our expectation is um, that we um, have to depend on families um, as well as others in the library um, to make sure that their children stay safe on the internet. Um, so there's a new section on internet safety for minors, uh, much like in our, our collection policy and other uh, places like our rules of conduct. We talk about the need for parents, guardians, or caregivers um, to pay attention to what their children review or listen to in the library as well as online, and that families should discuss together internet use, internet safety, and sharing personal information online. Under user responsibilities, we've added that patrons recognize that their use of the internet on library premises is conducted in a public place shared by many and acknowledge that the library district cannot protect the privacy of the data that is transmitted to parties via the internet. And then under um, complying with federal, state, and local laws, we list behaviors, including US um, use FERL's internet access to view, and these are things that are prohibited using the FRL's internet access to view, print, distribute, display, send, or receive images or graphics of obscene materials as defined by law or material that violates laws relating to child pornography. And these child pornography laws have been um, applied to libraries since the 1980s. So this is not something new. Disseminate, exhibit, and display to minors materials that are harmful to minors as defined by law. And then just made a few um, changes. Number three, I've added, it, including cyberbullying on social media sites is something that we prohibit. Falsification of one's age to gain access to internet sites, gain unauthorized access to any computing information or communications devices or resources, and that would be hacking, damage, alter, or degrade computer equipment, peripherals, software, or configurations, and that we are not responsible for any damages, direct or indirect, rising from internet services, um, and this is in particular for people who choose to use their credit cards and things like that on public computers. It's just really hard for us to um, guarantee their safety or security. Um, so this is a first reading of this policy. Um, I'll be looking for comments from the board and from the staff in the coming month. And um, we will, because I'd like to see this policy get approved um, quickly um, because our E-rate funding um, is dependent on it. I would like to ask that we hold a public hearing in July um, at our next meeting um, so that the public has the opportunity to comment on this policy. I, I have a question. Um, I, I, this may be too complex for this, but I think I understand the part about wireless access through your personally owned device being filtered. Mm -hmm. But if you're in the library using your personally owned device, and you're not using the wireless access, then is that behavior covered under just the patron conduct policy? Exactly, okay. it's under rules of conduct. Thank you. I do you have a question. I I feel like it's a silly question, but can you tell me what cyberbullying is exactly? I mean, I'm I can imagine what it might be, but it would be um, harassment of others online by um, you know comments, um, you know, accusations. Um, essentially, cyberbullying is when you take someone else's post and um, 
you know, essentially say, uh, how, I don't know if I can describe this in a good way, um, have bullying behavior. So it would be threatening, it could be um, condescending, it could be, um, yeah. Is the cyber bullying on social media sites part of what, is it SIPA? SIPA? Yes. SIPA? Is that a requirement that, that we have that in there? Um, it's encouraged that we include some language in here that talks about um, online behavior um, and how people behave online. Okay. It just like who's monitoring for people's comments? You know what it is? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, how are we to accomplish that? It would have to come through um, a complaint of some kind. Thank you. Mm -hmm. If you know, and again, this is some feedback you can give me if you feel like it's too vague. Um, okay, yep, you can think about it. Yep. Yes, my question is on the the editing from the clean draft from the mm. current to the clean draft. I'm looking at number one, and I'm I'm puzzled why that verbiage would be taken out the sexually explicit images, it's in the paragraph before, but it's dropped from the list. Because it's in the paragraph before. So I was yeah. trying not to keep it redundant. Um, also, Elizabeth, can you go on our website and bring up the rules of conduct? I'm sorry, I didn't pre prepare you for that. <laughs> Do you know where to look about us policies? I knew you did. <laughs> I think it's number eight, but I'm not 100% sure. So scroll down. Oh, I was wrong. It's number 12. It's already part of another policy. And so... Because it's covered here, I didn't think it was necessary to cover it in the second place. Okay. Well, yeah, it's number 12. Yeah. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, in a nutshell, can you, uh, this, this is just for me and for maybe some other parents in the community, can you tell us what happens when an adult is. Uh, caught looking at pornography in the library? We usually ask them to leave um, for the day. We ask, we ask them to turn it off, and then we ask them to leave for the day. It depends on the individual and the situation and exactly what they're looking at. Um, we do try to be pretty vigilant about it, but sometimes we have to depend on other people to tell us um, because people you know, are in computers in different locations throughout the building. And how do we handle repeat offenders? Uh, same way we would just exclude them for longer. So we would not, um, have we had any incidents like that where we end up having to exclude someone for a long period of time or is this kind of a rare thing? It doesn't happen very often, but it does happen occasionally where someone just continues to try to push the boundaries with us. And so we just extend it until we get to a place where it's maybe six months before they get to come back. And then we had talked in our committee, but I, I, I'd like for you to mention it out loud too. What happens when someone is caught looking at child porn? Well, um, luckily, I don't know that it's ever happened here that I'm aware of, um, but it's actually on the library staff to report it to the police um, because child pornography um, is considered, um, yeah, pretty neat. And how does that impact their access to the library? Um, I, you know, I, as again, I've never had that up, you know, I've never had that happen, so I don't know. Okay. Um, but my assumption is we would exclude them, trespass them. Um, because it's a felony offense, um, oh, Dave, I, hang on. I, thank you. <laughs> um, because it's a felony offense, I, we have a responsibility to report it to the police. But we don't have anything formal in place. Only that it's, you know, required by law that we do it. Um, and then, oh, sorry, go on. And then we had talked about what happens when someone, an uh, um, adult, is looking at pornography and there happens to be a minor next to them um, that's exposed to it maybe using the computer next to them how do, what what's we would handle it in exactly the same way of asking them to stop asking them to leave um following that same procedure 
And then do we have the same expectation across all libraries that if there is a dedicated children's space and there's computers in that space, I know not every library has that in our district, but when there's a dedicated children's space and there's computers that um, live there or people can take laptops in there, if, if there is um, an adult single user, I don't wanna have to say male or female, but sometimes you know there's a situation that tends to make people uncomfortable. Um, is there a way that we handle that when someone is hanging out in the kids area looking at things on the computer, harmless or not, but just how that um, is handled? I don't know that I can answer that um, since I don't work in the branch. Um, okay. And I know every library has a different situation in terms of access to computers and how many they have available to the public and how they make those choices based on activity in the building. and. Um, so it's up to every branch manager to handle the situation of adults that are in children's areas like using computers by themselves, whether whatever the comfort level is there. You know, I think most of them keep an eye on it and maintain, you know, some knowledge of who's on which computer in the building um, and what's happening. But um, again, you know, we'd have to speak to each individual branch. I'd hate to answer that simply because some of our branches like um, Yakult, for example, I think has one public computer. Um, right. It is just in the library. You know, it's there for all, everyone. It's one room. Sure. But I know it's a nuanced scenario, but in smaller branches, um, it can really make an impact on comfort level. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. So we'll root, um, can you remind me the public hearing is in July, you said? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm not hearing any other questions. Has Vikram been able to talk at all or is he typing as someone yeah. who's maybe watching? Chat? No. Oh, I okay. can talk. Okay, yeah. great. Um, we'll move on to the foundation MOU committee. At this point, we have no dates set up for any meetings. Thank you. Um, I did want to bring up one possibility uh, for us to consider. How I feel like we're not making much progress in the way of meetings. We're having trouble scheduling meetings. We've had um, historically some trouble communicating between the two groups, and it seems to lead to a couple of different paths. And I think one we should consider right now would be hiring a mediator between the two groups. So I wanted to bring that to the table and open it up for a discussion and feedback and just what you guys think of that. I would say at this point, uh, we would need to, first of all, agree on a mediator if we want to go down that pathway. And it should also involve, I would say, uh, our new executive director, rather than to put this on an interim director or anything before then. Yeah, I, I guess my concern would be um, if we hired a mediator, you know, who they would meet with, would it be the people that are currently on the MOU committee and the foundation committee uh, and have the foundation committee, have they agreed to that? Because at this point, they have not agreed to even meet with us in the future. Yeah, those are good questions. So this is the first time we've brought it up. Um, I think it's a worthy thing to pursue with them. I would definitely, just my thoughts on it, we, you know, could split cost. We would both, you know, mediators go between. So we would each have equal opportunity to give feedback and things. Um, I don't have a plan laid out in my mind. That's why I wanted to bring it to the group for discussion because I think our current agreement is from 2015. Is that right? I, it's just time to finish this. And so I was just hoping to talk about it. you say you have the current agreement, was it a finalized agreement, but it hasn't been looked at since? Our current MOU, the one they're looking at, but we can't come to a new agreement. I wonder if we should wait until the new director is with us. So that would be until September. I'm not sure if you're comfortable waiting that long. I mean, we're operating. <laughs> I mean, we've been operating under it for how many years? Well, um, yeah, yeah, we also have to agree who who is going to talk to the people on their side of the committee because they are not conversing with us at this point in time. 
So I guess what I'm looking for tonight is just permission, I guess, from everyone to maybe pursue this avenue with the foundation um, and just start having the discussion around it, not committing to anything official yet tonight, but start seeking information and seeing if we can come to some sort of agreement on how that would look. Is this something that you'd be doing? Because currently they're not speaking to me. <laughs> so I also have a comment on that. Like, Please, yes. As a MOU committee, we haven't even decided or come up you know, with a expectation list, like what is our expectation? What, what do we expect? So MOU committee should be at least providing that feedback. And you know, based on that, we have a mediator or however we resolve that part, that will be secondary. But first we should know what, what is our expectation. Like we have been talking many things, many points overall, but we should put that on the paper and get the whole board to agree on that okay you know these are the things we expect from the foundation i thought we were going to do that in the policy for fundraising correct so uh, that is also part of the mou committee right that we were going to we put can that give on them the our suggestions so the policy committee has looked at mou policy um it's not finalized yet or even we haven't. No, nope, we haven't done anything more with it than just talked yeah, about it sure as an idea. Yep. Yeah, it. You know, it's a a good policy to look at. I feel like there's so many questions in the air right now that. Do we want to bring it back to the next policy committee in July? Why don't we um, also make sure the whole board gets a copy of the policy? Do we have one now? And I just missed it. It was in the board packet. I'll, I'll make sure I'll resend it to you. Thank you. Um, so historically, there has it seems like there's been just kind of baggage passed on to the next director. Um, and so I think whether we'll wait or not, it will be possibly challenging. Um, but a mediator, especially if they can agree to it, especially if they, you know, contribute could really streamline a lot of these things that I think we continue to go back and forth on just on basic communication. So um, instead of even deliberating on that point, you know, see if we can push it maybe further. This is my two cents so that we can, uh, we have nothing to lose is what I was saying. We have nothing to lose and all to gain. So I think we should consider it um, and it could be um, a fantastic avenue. And perhaps this could be the thing that gives us a smooth, um, relationship for the next director, so we don't have to relive all of that. Who would pay for the me mediator, and are they willing? And are they willing to participate if they're not willing to sit down and talk now? Are you talking about foundation? Yeah. So yeah. generally, mediator, you split the cost. Well, I'm just, and so that way, not one person owns the majority of a mediator and then go ahead well we're trying to i don't know we need to ask them so all right is anyone have an objection to pursuing this conversation with foundation i have no idea yep yeah, I, I do have objection just on the front that uh, you know as a board we decide on what is required i think the relationship as it is it was the way it is for many years so nothing has changed on that front but now the expectation of the board has changed as to what we expect from the foundation and that is not being met so what are those expectations right uh, if you leave it and let it be as it as it was for many years that you know will run as is without any changes. So it's a wonderful relation the way it has been. It has been if you know if you consider it that way, it has run for many years. So but the expectations of the board has changed right now. That is something we should at least put few points around. Okay, we are we expect these 10 things to come out of it. Then you go to the mediation. Right? If you don't have any expectations, what are you mediating on? 
Well, right now we're at an impasse and it's hard to have even basic communication. And so I think a mediation would potentially open up that opportunity. Um, and after that, if that doesn't work, then I think we would really have to consider some of the things you know, where we're stuck and, and maybe have, this basically opens up some more options potentially for us. Because right now nothing's moving, No, not even replies and emails as far as I understand. Actually, I, I met with Rick this last week and we had a conversation about their new offices. Um, we worked together on Saturday to do a groundbreaking. Um, so I wouldn't say it's dead in the water or not happening. I'd just say it's not where I'd like to see it be. Okay. Yeah, we did well at, at the groundbreaking, I think. So next steps would be to, I feel like at the last, where we brought up the first reading, can someone re refresh my memory on the policy that was sent in by Vikram? There was talk about how a lot of these things were covered in the gift policy or other policies already, or was that, do I not remember that correctly? Um, there were a couple of things. Yeah. Yeah. And I just wanted to be sure we didn't have overlap. And so I guess I don't know what the next steps are for that. Is it you? <laughs> bring it to you write it and bring it and then we go over it yes yeah so that it's the, in the hands of the policy committee um, to kind of take the next steps and move it forward all right let's revisit this at policy committee in july can you put that on there for us and in the meantime um i think it would be smart if we start having the discussion about mediator it doesn't mean we're committing to anything right now so i want to know um are there any volunteers to, <laughs> to take this on and talk to the foundation about that? Could we wait till the next meeting? I'd like to take a look at our um, the whole um, relationship and before we start talking about hiring the mediator and what, what needs to be mediated, I wanna see that what we've got in place. For, for what? Got in place for any kind of, yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know what that takes. Um, Amelia, do you? What I can do is I can resend staff reports. Um, I did a markup of the foundation's most recent MOU version they gave us with the pieces that we had given them that were deleted from it. Um, so that you can see that'll give us a sense of where their objections are. Thank you. I that was all. So. Any other questions or discussion? Next up is personnel committee. Lee, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Can you give us an update on the personnel committee and um, the executive director uh, search? Sure. Um, we have, uh, just to recap, we have contracted with uh, Strategic Government Resources, SGR, to do an executive recruitment, because executive director recruitment for, for us. Uh, we're working with uh, one of their VPs of recruiting, Lynn Barbo Barboza. Um, Lynn uh, had several listening sessions with employees and board members over the course of the last two weeks, uh, interacting with 84 um, employees and board members that have given her feedback. She, uses, she used that information to develop a recruitment profile. Um, she and her graphics department are in the process of finalizing that. It'll be what we use to uh, post for recruitment and to share with applicants. I anticipate that we will have a draft of that profile available for the personnel committee and communications department to go through the 26th, starting the 26th. Once we finish that, they'll post that in various places. They have 55 different places that they post that recruitment and then do some targeted outreach. Uh, I anticipate that will be put out on, um, on social media, et cetera, by July 1st-ish. Uh, they'll recruit for 30 days, then they will pull together a summary for the personnel committee and meet and go through uh, the, each applicant with them. 
make some recommendations to move forward to virtual interviews with a group of semifinalists. And then we will, um, out of that, have some finalist candidates that we will invite to come to Vancouver for uh, several days for a uh, in-person interview process. I anticipate we'll be doing that the second or third week of September, be able to make an offer and then have someone start probably six weeks after, depending upon how much time they need to give their current employer and um, arrange for the move. So that's where we're at right now. Um, things are moving ahead. Um, once we hit the uh, job posting being out in the public arena, then we can regroup as a personnel committee and start talking about what's next for us for those virtual interviews and what we plan on doing in the in-person. Is there anything else the committee would like to add? No, I think that was really well done. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We'll move on to the added agenda item for email discussion. Um, it recently came to my attention that certain people receive a reply to email messages um, sent to the trustee email address. There, there are three ways to submit public comment. People come in person, they give us their comment. We don't really engage in debate with them or even reply for the most part. Um, people are allowed to call in virtually. Again, same type of thing. We don't really engage with them for the most part. Um, and then third, people can write a written comment to the board and they're distributed to us to read. Um, and then it, I didn't know actually until this week that some people do receive a reply to those. Um, I think I, I found out that anyone writing to the board for the first time can receive a comment. Everyone gets sort of a template reply. Uh, for I just feel since this is an avenue for public comment, people are writing into the FERL trustees email address thinking they're writing to the board. Um, but their Amelia is uh, reading them and at times deciding who to reply to and who not to. She does sign her name. She's not replying as the board. It just seems like it's a, a different type of treatment for other public comments. So my questions are, how, how is there a procedure for how it's determined which questions get a reply? Would you like me to respond? Please. Yeah, um, so the way I um, look at it is if I have already responded to someone and they're writing again on the same topic, I do not send a second reply um, because I've already answered that question. So for example, someone has written to me um, that they no longer want us to do a particular program. I will respond once with, here are, here is some information about that program. Um, and then if they write again the next month saying, I don't want you to have that program, I'm not going to resend that same email to them. I figure I've sent them one response. Everyone always gets an auto response to any email they send to the board that says the board has received your message. Those go to an email box that Rhonda manages and she um, puts those um, into the document that you see each month that is your uh, June letters to the boards of trustees. So we make sure that all of those letters come to you. And so for people, go ahead. Um, uh, then could we also just get a copy of the response if you do send a personalized response? Sure, lots of them, as Christy mentioned, are templates, so they'll all look exactly alike. Um, so I'm happy to do that, but um, how would you like me to provide those to you? I guess um, I, I'm not talking about the, the auto replies, but if, if nope. there's a response that goes out on this, giving information on a specific topic that you crafted personally, could we get a copy of that along with the comment mm -hmm. in our board packet? Sure. Um, they're just, they're all going to be the same. So it's going to make your board packet very yeah, I long. think she's asking not for the template ones, but the ones you personally craft. And we don't get that many comments per month in our packet. So yeah. it shouldn't be that hard to put them in the your reply in with it, right? That's correct. I, okay. I'm happy to do that, actually. Thank you. It's just going to make, I'll just warn you, it's going to make it very long. It, 
so you write a lot of replies. I think this month we had what 10 emails. Can we just get them in, like when we get the letters that you send to us? Can we get the automatic put your response the response to it? It's not necessarily in the board packet, but it comes to us in the email with all the letters. I, so I don't know if I'm at, if we're asking clearly. So you know how we get the Google Doc or whatever mm -hmm. every month. Yep. There, I'm just guessing a number. I didn't count them, but there were maybe ten this month. I'm sure you didn't reply to everyone personally. So how would it make it really long if your response was added? There are months when we get 40 letters. So, you know, I, I just every month is different. And you copy paste the letters, right? So you could just copy mm -hmm. paste the response. That sure. would be great. Well, the letters that we've seen, mm -hmm. they're coming through emails to us. They're not coming in the, in the board packet. Am I right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. So if you attached your response that would be an email to us as well that wouldn't be in the board packet that's correct it, it would add to your workload to have Just to copy and paste copy that yep i just i would appreciate it if you can do something that the person could be you turned your shoulder you turned him can't hear you can't hear you now, I, I, so if it is, <laughs> if we need clarification, such as the one that where you said it, it's not a real person, it's it's something you've seen re repetitively, that would be helpful to know, okay, don't get concerned about this. This is the situation. I'd personally be fine with just your reply sent, and we'll learn that over time if it keeps saying the same person over and over, I think. I just don't want to make you have to write a lot of stuff with each one. Did you want to say? When someone asks to do a virtual comment, I send them a response, which includes the link to the Zoom and this is your email confirmation. You don't want, it's not automated, but it's the- Is it scripted? Yeah. Uh, occasionally I'll add something like, you didn't say what city or county you're from, please add that. Okay. Um, Rhonda, can you, I saw you shaking your head no. Can you respond? Uh, I was just, the only part that I have in this is the emails come directly to me first and then I forward to Amelia, then she puts them in the Google Doc for you guys. All right. Um, so Amelia, your email is public on our website. It's super easy to find. So if people wanted to um, open a dialogue with you, they can write you directly, right? It's pretty easy. And they often do. Okay. I, I would just ask you to consider that in your bylaws, I, it is stated that I am your representative to the community. So the reason I respond when people have questions about the library is so that I am able to respond as the representative of the district to them. I don't represent myself as a member of the board. I represent myself as the executive director of the district. But the issues I have with it is that these are public comments. No, you don't respond to any other person that comes to the microphone, even if it's their first time here. Why are written comments being treated differently? I don't think that's the right way to handle things. So you would prefer that the district just remain silent? on? Comments? I would prefer that we they're addressing the board I think that if there's an issue that needs addressed, we should empower the board to talk about things openly. And if there's an issue that needs, the public is tired of us sitting up here silently, that would be a great avenue for us to discuss. So I think if they want to open a dialogue with you, that's great. They have your email, but these folks are writing into FERL trustees and getting a response from you. Yes, you're a spokesperson, but they're emailing the board. So the fact that it's a public comment and they're getting special treatment, whatever you want to call it, it's not keeping in line with our own guidelines not to engage that sort of thing. So, um, yeah. Christy, I, I understand your position. And I'll tell you that once you and I had that conversation earlier this week, I stopped responding. So I haven't responded to any since that point. And I won't respond to any at, from here till the end of July because, you know, I, it, it feels to me that I'm not um, trusted to uh, help provide some information, which I believe is my job, um, to help people understand why the library might do a specific thing. But I hear you and I understand why you don't want me to do that and, and I'm fine with it. 
I, I will stop. I understand your frustration. I feel like this probably feels super personal to you, but I want this to carry forward to whoever's next. This isn't about you. It's about how do we handle public comment and are we being consistent? And we're not. Um, I also would love to see um, some of the past comments we've had, maybe for a couple months period, what are the replies that have been sent out? Um, because the comment that I saw was sort of um, dismissive and pretty disappointing. And it it's kind of, it's just disappointing that that's the face that's being sent out as a reply from the board, even though you're signing your name, it's coming from the trustees. So, well, we can always put it on the agenda. If there's a particular topic that somebody wants yeah. to discuss, like banning books, we can put banning books on the agenda. Absolutely, yes. But we have to be careful that we are following what our policy is. And I'll tell you, going through all the policies, it is very easy to misspeak as a board member because I don't have all these in my head. But but to be afraid to even talk about it like this is not the answer. And we're going to make mistakes, I think. But to be transparent and talk is super, it's really important. I, I do just want to share one thing with you. And that is tonight, um, I said hello to someone coming in who's been a frequent speaker and um, a frequent writer. And she mentioned that she hadn't heard from us in a long time. And that's because she's frequent. So I stopped sending emails to her. Um, she said, I still get that thing that you got my email, but you never send me any answers to my questions. But you don't reply to people in person. That's correct. Yeah. I, I, but I do when they write to you with something that I think they could use more information. You just about. said, I reply when they write to you. I, I'm sorry. I just don't think it's the I, right way to do it. I already said, Christy, that I hear you okay. and I understand where you're coming so from. So I would like I'm to request stop. that we could see replies that have went out to patrons for a reasonable amount of time, a few months. How many would you say you write in a month? No idea, but I keep them all, so I have no problem at all finding them for you. Um, it could be just a reasonable amount, like maybe a month or so. I would just love to read some past replies. Okay, Thank no you. problem. Um, the board cannot respond, right, to emails? If, if you're going to speak as a board, I you I don't know that you can individually respond without stepping outside of that. Right, right. Role. So there's there's an expectation to receive information, read it, leave it alone. And um, you know, for the most part, I have been okay deferring to your expertise. Again, we're volunteers. This is your ex this is your expertise by far. Um, we did receive a complaint, and you know, a lot of complaints that come through those those messages. But that's what kind of sparked the um, discussion um, where I think someone from the public was surprised to get that sort of response, uh, maybe not expecting it. And so um, it's not a sense of suspicion. It's just something to take a look at where um, my hunch is people sometimes write in one of the reasons might be because they don't feel comfortable with showing up in person, anything like that. And so um, if that avenue feels dismissive to them again it's subjective but if that avenue feels a certain way then we're losing that participation and so there's that's why we want to be a little more sensitive and um as a board we do speak as one but there are things that we we absolutely do not agree on and so sometimes it lands in a way where that is not maybe how the board would at this time respond to something and so it's it's a it's a conversation i suppose I, I think the hardest part for me is I'm still in charge of day-to-day -day operations for the district. And when someone writes to me and says, don't do that again, and we haven't done it for four years, I still feel like I need to send a response that says, we haven't done it for four years, but here's some information about it if you're interested in knowing more. Um, because we're an information organization. That's what we do. Are you talking specifically about drug and story? Hours? Absolutely. Yeah. That is the number one response I have given over four years and I have a template set up and it's automatic and I you know I don't feel that it's dismissive I feel that it's informative um but that's from my perspective so so I have a suggestion uh go ahead Vic so uh, Amelia, if 
most of your emails to the trustee inbox are regarding that drag queen hour and what you are sending is the standard template why don't you just put it in a web page on the library website right and just send them uh, auto respond with the link in it no need to respond personally if that is the information you know that is being conveyed anything beyond that should not come to the trustees it should be coming to you or if you know it's any email regarding some you know information or public information that is required that needs your attention that can be taken up by you Vikram, that is what I do, and, and I'll just I'll forward that to the board so that you can see it. Yeah, I, I'm just saying you don't have to even respond personally. It can be in your in that auto response if that goes to everybody. So everybody is getting the same response irrespective of what their content is. The only if reason I would hesitate is Drag Queen Story Hour doesn't represent the library district. And I'd hate to put that on every single auto response email I send out because that's not what everyone is writing to us about. Um, you know, the auto response just says, we've received your letter, thank you. You know, um, the response I send is more specific to what the question is. Um, and I always try to be respectful and, and respond in a way, you know, that I think is accurate. Um, Can we add to that auto response a question of would you like a response? No, that'd be too much. I, I would say that everyone that writes wants a response. Okay. <laughs> no. No, but I guess this is something for us as a board to think about um, going forward, especially with the new director. Marianne, you had something. I think I'll hold it until, um, because I haven't seen what the questions are, the responses, and I I really feel like the um, drag queen group will be pressuring us, period. And we need to set up a reasonable way to respond to that. That's not going to put 80% of your time with drag queen. I mean, I'm already somewhat uncomfortable that we do spend so much of the library's management time on drag queen issues. That's, there are other issues that the library has. I mean, we're being, we're being managed by somebody other than. And we do a lot more than that, for sure. But what I'm saying is she doesn't have to respond. It's taking work off her plate. So nobody's responding? Not to the public comments by email, they are now, but no one receives a response in person. I'm not sure why we're responding and adding to Amelia's workload by email. We, re we received uh, a heads up, I guess you could say from somebody that was not expecting to get a response from Amelia. And I don't believe it was about Drag Queen Story Hour. Um, I did, and and so that's what sparked this conversation because I did not know that there were responses that were going out, and I'm, I might have I might have missed that as part of the protocol. Um, so that's why we're talking about it so much tonight because we just didn't know this was going on. We didn't know that there was, um, you know, a instant reply, and then I think you said there's always a response and then if they keep emailing, there's no response, you file people, you file it away, like you have this whole procedure and um, you know, we didn't know about it. And that's falls on us because we didn't ask. I, I just say the thing to remember about everything we do is they're public records. Um, any other questions or discussion? Can we actually see the last like three months of emails and responses? Thanks so much. You mean just the personally drafted ones, not this one? Yeah, okay. yeah. That's fine. Yeah. That's fine. That way we can really, you know, set our minds at ease as far as 
this new information. Thank you. Other questions or discussion? Um, we'll move into board comments. Are there any comments the board wishes to make? Yes, I wish to thank the Goldendale friends for uh, hosting us and for Tara to host us as well. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Who made the treats? The monastery. Thank you to them for the treats. Also, Mike, thank you for your quick thinking. I had no idea you could just pull a speaker out of the air and hook it up. Thank you for that and all the troubleshooting with the your thank you for all your work on these meetings. I appreciate it. And to our security guard for some yeah. interesting situations. Thank you. Yeah, I want to thank the uh, staff uh, from here and from Greater FBRL for um, working with the, you know, surprise big turnout tonight. And then I do want to ask the Goldendale um, branch to please do consider the comments that we heard tonight and please update us on those deliverables of connecting with the homeschool community. Thanks so much. The next regular meeting will be Monday, July 17th, 2023, hybrid and white salmon community library. Hey, Christy, before you. Yes, go ahead. Uh, one last uh, question for Amelia and our collections manager. Uh, in the in in the presentation, it was listed all the you know fee forgiveness that was done for people eighteen and beyond. So, was there any communication sent out to those people? Hey, now you're you know okay to come back to the library, or is that something that can be done? If not, Vic Lynn has left, and I am not really sure how. That's they fine. We you can yeah just yeah. check well, it out if you can and thank you. Yeah, I'll know. follow up with her. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, everybody. I would entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. Second. Meeting adjourned. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Bye-bye.